Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Sur Herrera Paredes. I am a postdoc at the Department of Biology at Stanford University, where I study bacterial evolution and ecology. As you probably are already aware, the world that we live is really a microbial world. You can look at any corner of our planet, from the most exuberant to the most desolate place, and you will find an incredible community of bacterial microorganisms that are thriving in any of those environments. Thus, it is not surprising that also that from the bacterial perspective, multicellular organisms like humans, us, or like plants, for example, are also just collections of habitats that are filled by many of these same microorganisms, which are just trying to find opportunities to thrive. And those organisms are not just sitting idly in ourselves or in plants, but they are affecting our biology in ways that we are just beginning to fully appreciate. One of the first questions that we ask whenever we are interested in characterizing and understanding a specific microbial community is which are the specific types of bacteria that are present in that community, how abundant they are, and how do those abundances vary across different uh, environments. So the plot that we're going to try to do today uh, is a uh, a plot like the one I'm showing right here that you can see below me. And it is a plot where each bar represents an individual microbial community that was collected from an individual plant. And then the colors in the bar represents the proportion of each bacterial phylum that was observed. The data from this uh, plot is a small subset of a data from an analysis uh, that I did uh, back in my PhD, where we look at the bacterial communities that live in the inside the plant root, in the surface of the root, and also in the surrounding soil. In order to get the data for this workshop, you can go to this URL that you can see right below me, which will take you to this website that is to my right. This is a GitHub repository where you will find everything you need to run the analysis and the specific files with the data we're going to analyze are in this folder called data. Uh, inside this subfolder called RISO for RISOSphere and there you will find these three files, OTU table, OTU taxonomy and sample metadata. You can download those files directly here from your browser, or if you're already somewhat familiar and comfortable with GitHub, you can uh, download the whole repository as a zip file, or you can clone it. Whatever way uh, you feel comfortable, uh, it will work the same. Now, for running the analysis and creating the plot, we're going to be using an R package called ggplot2, which you may have already heard about. And I'm going to perform, be performing this, uh, this analysis on RStudio. Just in the same way as getting your data, you can use whichever platform you feel comfortable with for running R code. You could use a Jupyter notebook, you could use Atom Hydrogen, or you could use ba the base R graphical interface. All of them will be equally successful. I will be using an RStudio notebook, which I am opening right now. Uh, and I'm going to change the title to something more meaningful. And I will share at the end with, uh, with all of you uh, through the GitHub repository the code that I'm going to write. If you are not super familiar with RStudio notebooks, the only thing you need to know is that everything that is inside this triple back ticks with this little R in curly braces, it is going to be R code that then I can execute and display the output side by side. Okay, so now we're ready to begin. The first step is to load the packages that we are going to be using. As I said, we are going to be making our plot with ggplot2, which we could load directly, but I always like to load, to load it through another package called tidyverse, which is in fact just a collection of packages that add on top of ggplot a lot of useful functions to your R session. Now that we have the tidyverse loaded, we can then load the first data table that we want to use. This is the OTU table that I described just before. For reading that table, we can use the read TSB function from the tidyverse, which, as the name might suggest, reads a tab separated file. There you have it. Here you can see that I read it, the, this data table and I printed it just below. When you run this for yourself, you will obviously need to change the path to the location where you downloaded the specific the files for this workshop. So let's look at the file for a minute. The file has a number of columns. The first one is called OTUID. OTU stands for Operational Taxonomic Unit. And the only thing you need to know in this context is that 
OTUs are collections of sequences that are similar enough that we can say that, that they came from related organisms. However, we cannot say for sure if they belong to the same species. Besides the OTU ID column, we have a number of columns. Each one represents a different sample. And then the cells in this matrix tells us how many times we observe every specific OTU in each one of these samples. I will make a short parenthesis here to show that when I read the table, uh, RStudio actually showed me a little warning. This warning indicates me that the function read TSB tried to guess which types of of data was in the columns of my data table. And it guessed correctly. It guessed that the OTUID should be a character type object and all the other columns should be numeric values. So we could just keep going and everything will be all right, but it is always a good practice to tell as many functions as possible what types of data to expect. Because then if, the, if they are expecting something and they see something different, they can give us useful warnings which can help us find errors in our analysis and code. There, you can see that I now specify which type of data to expect and we get exactly the same table, but the warning is gone, which is always a good sign. Now the next step is to think about the plot we want to make. So let's look at it again. Here it is right below me. And the first thing that we need to define whenever we're making a plot with ggplot2 is what are the main axes of the figure. In this case, it's very simple. The x-axis is simply the samples and the y-axis is simply our measure of abundance. And once we define that, what we need to know is that for making a ggplot2 plot, we need all the values that are going to be on the x-axis in one column and all the values that are going to be on the y-axis in another column right next to it. But if we look back to our data table, our OTU table, we will see that that is not how the data is currently formatted. In fact, instead of having all the values, for example, for samples in one column, we have one column for each sample. So one of the most useful things that I'm going to show you today is a function called pivot longer, which is a pretty useful function that can convert any sort of matrix data into a format that is easily accessible by ggplot2. Here you can see how I use this function. It is pretty simple. We just have to tell it which variables we want to put into one new column that's going to have, that's gonna, that is going to become our master column for that variable, which in this case is our sample names. We could write all the sample name columns, but that would be pretty long. So instead of that, we tell it which variables we do not want. And we use the minus symbol. And we say the only variable that we do not want is the OTU ID, because all the other variables are the samples that we want. And then we tell it what to name the new variables that, it, that it's going to create. The first one is going to be called sample ID because it is going to store sample IDs. And the second one is going to be called count because it is going to store counts. And here you have it. Now we have a pretty long data table that has close to 9,000 rows where each one of these rows corresponds to one entry in the matrix below. So the next step is now to add the additional information that we want to include in our plot. So as you can see now, right below me, uh, the other, another part of information that we want to add is the OTU taxonomy. As I was saying earlier, we know that OTUs are all different, but they are not all equally different from one another. Some OTUs are more related. And we express that relationship through their taxonomy, specifically here by the bacterial phylum to which they belong. First, let's read the file that contains the taxonomy information from the OTUs using the same read TSB function that you, we used before. So here it is. Now we can see that we read the, the file that contains information matching every OTU to the bacterial phylum to which it belongs. And now we want to merge the information from this new table called tax for taxonomy with our previous object named that, which is our master data table. Uh, basically, we would like to add the information of the phylum as an extra column to this table. There's many ways to do that, but I am going to show you another function that is pretty useful and it's part of the tidyverse as well.
This function is called left join and it simply matches two tables by a shared column, in this case OTUID, and then adds columns from the second table to the first one according to this matching criteria. And so after I run this, you can see here that now I have exactly the same table as before that we had in that, but with this extra column indicating the phylum of each OTU. Now we are gonna do exactly the same with the sample metadata. We are going to read the file with the same function and we're gonna use the same left join function to merge that information into our master data table. And here are the results. Again, you can see that we have the same, the very same information, but we have added now to our master data table these three new variables, soil, accession, which for our purposes today, it is the same as plant genotype and fraction, which indicates which, what type of sample uh, that observation corresponds to. So we are now ready to start plotting using ggplot2. Here we have some basic ggplot code that then allows us to create the backbone of the plot we are trying to make. We have all the samples sorted into individual facets, which are these little subplots within the plot, uh, indicating from which type of sample these observations came from. One common issue with this type of plot in ggplot, and this is an internal ggplot problem, is these random looking white lines that show in the middle of your plot. There is an easy fix to that, and it is setting the option width equal to one within the geom bar uh, function. Another nice feature about facets is that we can use not only one variable, but combinations of variables to separate our observations and look for interesting patterns. For example, we can separate our samples not only by the fraction to which they belong, but also by the type of soil. You can see the results here, and it is pretty clear now that there is some interesting patterns that we should investigate further. We have now the backbone of our plot ready. There is just a couple of things that we need to add. One is to choose better colors, and the other is to sort the different phylums according to their average abundance. You should always think carefully about the colors that you're gonna choose, especially when more than two colors are required. A collection of palettes from a package called R Color Brewer is a good place to start, and you can access them directly through ggplot. So that is what we're going to do here. Now, while you can see clearly in this plot, for example, that the group of bacteria known as proteobacteria are the most abundant, it is not so obvious which other groups come in second. This is easy to calculate in code, and in the repository, you can find uh, one of the many ways to do it. But, I will, but for our purposes here, I have already calculated it, and you can see the results here. So I want to reorder the way in, in which these phylums are displayed according to these relative abundances. And the way to do that is to convert the column corresponding to phylum in our master data table to a factor that has this specific ordering. Here is the code to perform that conversion. And you can also see that I changed the order a little bit so that the unclassified sequence are at the very bottom since they are actually not a taxonomic group. And it is useful sometimes to see, see them clearly. Here is the plot with the phyla, phyla order in the right order. And you can see, for example, that there is a couple of samples where the unclassified sequence are suspiciously high. If we were doing a full analysis, those were samples that we will likely have to have a closer look to find if there is any issues that need to be dealt with. We basically have finished the plot that we set up to make. We just need to add a few tweaks to make it more pretty.
Here's the final code and the final version of this plot. The only changes that I did was making this strip text bold and removing the gray background, changing the labels on the y-axis so that they actually show percentages instead of a zero to one scale, changing the title of the y-axis so it says relative abundance instead of counts, rotating the sample IDs on the x-axis so that they're more readable. I also slightly reduced the number and that's it. So just to summarize, the, the things that we did was first create a data table where each axis that we're gonna use in our main plot is in an individual column. Then we added the OTU taxonomy, we added the sample metadata, we ordered the taxonomy group so they show in the order we wanted, and we plotted with ggplot. If you go back to this URL with the repository, you will find a, a file with an extended example where you can find even more details about every step of the way. There is also additional exercises there should you want to explore this more. Thank you. Gracias.